Hey, welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the podcast that goes deeper into segments and topics that aired originally on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. This, this, this is what you got to think of this podcast as, right? This podcast is like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? You, know, you do it a buffet. You keep coming back for more. And we got all the cuisine you could want. We got a little bit of spicy, a little bit of sour, sometimes sweet. We got the ice cream machine. And your plate is overflowing with goodness by the end. That's what this podcast is. It's broccoli and a fajita and sprinkles for no damn reason because you deserve them. I'm Roy Wood Jr., and it is Pride Month. So we're talking about trans rights and anti-trans legislation that's going on all over this country. Roll the clip. These Republicans act. They act like all they care about is the health and well-being of the kids. But it kind of gives the game away when they start adding on stuff that's basically just, and don't play with dolls or we'll tell your mom. And look, I'm not a doctor, right? As I found out when I tried to take out my cousin's appendix. R.I.P. in Gosnati. But these Republican lawmakers are also not doctors. And people who are doctors see things very differently. Major medical organizations such as the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics oppose the bill. With alarm and dismay, pediatricians have watched bills through state legislatures across the country. It threatens the health and well-being of transgender youth. Young people, when they reach a certain age, um, if they have gender dysphoria, which means that they experience mental duress because they are um, transgender, might not want to go through puberty. And so they're doctors might prescribe them puberty blockers so that they don't have to go through puberty and can make a decision when they're older about whether or not they want to medically transition. So look, medical professionals and trans people themselves say that treating kids early can be extremely beneficial, which makes you wonder, what's really behind all of these laws? If you ask me, it's hate. Yeah. A lot of these people are angry because trans people don't conform to a neat idea of gender. And as humans, we like things when they are neat and organized the way we want. It's why people got so mad when they said Pluto wasn't a planet. Well, if it's not a planet, then what is it? Well, actually, it's a rocky Kuiper Belt body that straddles the line between... And... Ah, I'll kill you! But as scared as some people might be by the idea of a trans person, it is nothing compared to how scared trans kids are dealing with problems that they don't always understand in a world that oftentimes does not accept them. So if these states are gonna be passing laws to help anyone feel safer, it should be them. Today I'm joined by ACLU Deputy Director for Transgender Justice, Chase Strangio. Welcome to the show, Chase. Thank you for having me, I'm psyched to be here. Also joining us for this wonderful, wonderful conversation is the author of the Present Age Newsletter, Parker Malloy. Parker. How goes it? Hey, I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you as well. Now, we've seen a wave of anti-trans bills across the country. You know, can, can the two of you set the stage for our listeners, number one, for what's going on in Texas and across the nation? We just talked about this on the show um, about a week ago. We were talking about how they're trying to pass laws now where if you're a trans athlete competing in particular sports, we want to check genitals, internal and external organs. Like, it is getting wild out there. But let's just start first with fucking Texas. Beep it. I know I'm not supposed to curse. I don't care. Let's start, let's start with Texas. Uh, if, you, if the two of you could just kind of set the table for what's happening right now in the country. You know, we can always look to Texas when some terrible legal thing is happening. Um, and unfortunately, that is true right now. Um, Texas isn't even in legislative session right now. So this is 2022. The legislature is not even convening. But of course, Governor Abbott, Attorney General Ken Paxton have decided that the priority in this moment of many, many crises is to target trans kids and not just target trans kids uh, in the way that many other states are targeting trans kids. And we can talk about that, but to really escalate at another level. And unfortunately, what we've seen in Texas is that the governor issued a directive essentially announcing that in the state, gender affirming health care, uh, which is just uh, the basic health care that is supported by every major medical association in the United States, that health care, when it is recommended by a doctor, by parents, and by a young person, they're all agreeing that the care is medically necessary, 
um, and prescribed by a doctor, that that's a form of child abuse. And what's terrifying here is that they issue this directive to the Department of Child and Protective Services. Um, and essentially, within a few days, you start having families in Texas who are investigated by the government for simply loving and affirming their their, their child. Um, and that means that kids are afraid to go to school because they could be reported to CPS just for being transgender. Parents are afraid to take their kid to the doctor. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about care that is being recommended by doctors, that is supported by medical associations. So you have parents following the medical advice of, of their doctors. You have parents trying to do right by their kids who are suffering and struggling and seeing their kid improve. And now you have the state coming in and saying, you know, not only are we going to take away that care, we're going to make it a crime, we're going to criminalize you for providing that care to your kids. And so this is a really drastic escalation. It's terrorizing families in Texas. Many people are trying to flee the state. Those who can't flee or don't want to for good reason because their lives are there are stuck in this situation where they don't know how to care for themselves. They don't know how to care for their families. Um, thankfully, we were able to block much of this directive in court, um, but there are parts of it that are still being implemented. We're going to have a subsequent lawsuit to try to expand the nature of judicial relief that we're able to get. Um, but this is a situation where, you know, we have a conversation that starts about at bathrooms um, and quickly escalates to where kids are being threatened to be removed from their homes, from their loving and affirming homes. Um, this is a really scary time. Uh, for trans young people and their families. Um, and Texas is, in many ways, ground zero for that. Ah, uh, remember the good old days, just a good old bathroom argument. Yeah. The good old-fashioned days of bigotry. And now, yeah. <laughs> you know, things have just started changing. You know, Alabama has a law that they're trying to get passed that is wild. The same thing going on in Florida. Almost 300 different laws across the United States right now. Parker, why do you think, well, here's a better question. What's the motivation behind these bills and why is there an uptick in so much anti-trans legislation, specifically from the right and targeting trans youth and the education of children about uh, about this whole this whole issue? I, th I think it goes back to the marriage equality decision at, at the Supreme Court. After that happened, what you started to see was a lot of the anti marriage equality groups, anti-LGBTQ anti generally, uh, shift their focus to trans issues because that we made for an easier target. And for a while you would see things like bathroom bills popping up where it would be, oh, we're going to require people to use the bathroom that matches their original birth certificate. And over, over time, it seems like the public wasn't quite on board with the bathroom stuff because a lot of the time, they would be stumped by questions like, is there any evidence th that this is necessary? And the answer was pretty much no. So th there was this sort of shift over to focusing on uh, public accommodations more generally. You had in 2016, North Carolina passed HB2, which was a bill that targeted trans people, but it also preempted a lot of the other local level non-discrimination protections. And that was met with some backlash and that pretty much went away mostly. But in recent years, it doesn't seem like our allies necessarily have our backs as much as they used to. And there hasn't been the kind of North Carolina-sized backlash to these bills. So what you have is you have a state put, trying to push something that is anti-trans or anti-LGBT generally, and if they're not getting a lot of pushback, if, if businesses aren't threatening to leave the states, if boycotts aren't happening, if, if all of this other stuff that, that made HB2 in North Carolina so toxic for the governor at the time... Uh, who lost in his re-election bid, those elements that, that hurt the economies of these states just aren't there anymore. And so what happens is they'll pass these bills and there won't be a whole lot of public backlash to it. Trans people will see this in the news and think to themselves, oh my God, I am terrified, uh, because it is scary. And I think that one of the reasons that they're they're shifting to to children, focusing on trans children, is it really appeals to this old school sense of um, save the kids, protect the children. It's the same sort of thing that happened in the 70s when it came to, you know, Anita Bryant and uh, 
just general gay rights. There was this whole, yeah. oh, they're trying to recruit your kids. And so we're seeing a lot of that same stuff happening now. Yeah, because it, it, at first, you know, with the trans bathroom bills, it was, what if you get attacked in the bathroom by one of them? It could be yeah. you. And that didn't work. And now they're going, well, it could be your kid. A trans athlete just dunked on your cisgender child. You don't want that to happen again. Is part of the strategy of the right to deliberately create bill after bill after bill and headline after headline after headline so that it just gets all lost in the smoke so that people who don't know everything that the trans community is going through just become apathetic. Yeah, I, th I think that that is a big part of it. Just a few months back, there were, there were all those b states pushing the anti-critical race theory type bills where it was, they were saying, oh, they're trying to indoctrinate your kids with critical race theory and, <laughs> and all of this stuff that wasn't being taught in first grade or whatever. And the same people who were behind that push are the same people who are behind this, this current push to target trans kids. And they're really just kind of warping a lot of this language. They're saying that um, acknowledging that trans people exist in a classroom setting, people are trying to frame that as a form of sexual grooming, they're trying to groom kids to be trans or gay or what have you. And it's the same, it's that same sort of, you know, argument, oh, they're trying to recruit your children. And so they say all these things and they make all these arguments and, and suddenly you have parents who, you know, or people just generally who have a lot of, they mean well, but every time they turn on the TV or read the news, they're seeing some story about a politician talking about, oh, this man just came in and beat all these girls and, <laughs> you know, basketball, basically the, the, the swimmer. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've, you've got that, this, this idea that there is this, this, you know, epidemic of trans people dominating sports. I mean, it's, it's the plot of the movie Ladybugs, uh, <laughs> but the, it's, it's not really reflected in, in reality. I mean, even with that, they found one great trans athlete who dominated her sport and she won a national championship and they're using her story, the story of Leah Thomas, as kind of a pretext to attack trans people generally. There's no reason to ban trans girls in second grade from competing against cisgender girls in second grade. There is not a physical advantage that's happening there. The whole point of it, the goal of it, is to essentially drive, you know, hopefully trans kids stay closeted and they grow out of it. That's kind of their argument. They, they think that they can push that, but, I mean, as someone who... who I'm trans and my whole life, believe me, if I could grow out of it, I probably, you know, that would have been great for me. Uh, but I can't, I tried. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that that's, that's kind of the big problem. The people who are pushing these laws against us, I don't think that they actually care. I don't think that they actually believe that, oh, if you just take this away from trans kids, if you don't affirm them that they'll, they'll grow out of it and they'll be better. They just don't care if we exist in a happy sense or exist at all. And that's, that's what's, what's been frustrating is to try to cut through the noise and get down to what it's about. When someone talks about, oh, I just care about fairness in sports, I keep trying to tell them, but none of this actually has to do with fairness in sports. They're using sports as a way to get their, to kind of get a wedge in there so yeah. they can attack trans rights more generally. Chase, to that point, like, like, let's let's just go with with this notion of protecting the children, as Parker says. What does that actually mean for trans children? Because you know, we can't argue with that, right? You know, everybody wants to protect the children, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, so first of all, so much violence has been done in the name of protecting women and children, and which in this country almost always means white women and children. And it's been the ways in which the government has leveraged its most violent impulses under that discourse. And if you look at what's happening Ooh. in Texas, Ooh, uh, get them, get them, keep going. You know, if you look at Texas, right? I, you know, I'm a parent. I'm in a state where I'm afraid to send my kid to school because of COVID. I'm afraid to send my kid to school because of shootings. Texas just had this horrific murder uh of uh in schools of you know mostly latinx kids and the government's response the first thing they ban is drag queens 
Like, are we, are we, are we a serious country at all? The idea that the greatest threat to our young people is that they'll feel free and happy and joyful as opposed, you know, so instead of looking at actual violence that people are experiencing, we have this goal of repression. And I think going back to the sports discourse and this reality, uh, you know, the, the sports bills in this country originated most aggressively after two young black girls in, in Connecticut who are trans had some success in Connecticut and a bunch of white cis girls freaked out and went on Fox News consistently to talk about how they were threatened. And the discourse of their threat uh, was deeply raced in a state with uh, a lot of white wealthy people. And you have these two young black girls who enjoyed running, who were thriving in their sport. They were attacked so aggressively uh, and there was a right-wing media circus focused very explicitly on them, which then fueled the anti-trans bills uh, that then proliferated around sports. And this connects, I might add, to a 100-year-long, at least, history of notions of sex verification in sport that can be traced back to the early 20th, early 20th century that had a lot to do with policing the bodies, particularly of Black and brown women from the global South who are not transgender, just telling women uh, who are cisgender, who just happen to be Black, who happen to be brown, who happen to be from the global South, that they're not really women. That implemented the first sex testing regimes that we saw in the international context, which we're now importing into the kindergarten through fifth grade context in the United States and opening up the door to this type of policing of the bodies of young women, which is almost always going to disproportionately harm black and brown young girls who are already told that they're not the right kind of girl. Um, and that's the reality of how this is happening. But it again goes back to what does it mean to protect children, which children and how. And when it's the power of the state deciding which children are valuable, we know which children are going to be valuable. It's going to be white, cis, Christian, heterosexual children at the expense of everyone else. Now, you have said a lot. <laughs> you have said a lot. I want to talk a little bit about how these laws affect the trans community medically. What mm -hmm. is that a word? Medically? Medically? Sure. Medically? You know, medical care. We, we yeah. want to talk about how access to medical care and the lack thereof and the hurdles. And also I want one of you to define for our listeners the term safe folder. We'll do that after the break. This is Beyond the Scenes. Parker, let's, let's start with you. Let's just talk about the implications in terms of medical care and like how have the strategies and attacks from conservatives evolved over the years to create a system that has now expanded beyond bathroom bills and sports and is now attacking medical care to the trans community? Sure. Yeah. Well, so one thing that I have learned, and this doesn't just apply to trans issues, but it, but this is a great example of it. In my years of working as a media critic and working at progressive media watchdog groups, I have noticed a very consistent strategy on the right. And what it is, is it's to take an issue and it's to poke little holes in it and then repeat those over and over and over. And they don't have to be true. They make Joe Biden out to be the coolest man on the planet when it comes to trans issues. They're like, Joe Biden wants to abolish gender. Joe Biden wants to, you know, like Joe Biden wants to hand out hormones like candy. And, you know, all of these things that would be awesome if, if Joe Biden was was half as cool as they, they made him out to be, you know. And, the, and, and that goes, goes to show on a, on a lot of other issues, too. But in this case, what they do is they say that trans people basically have it too good that it's too easy for trans people to get medical care, that there are people, that there are loads of people who are just being waved through, you know, clinics and getting put on medication that they don't know what it is, that the people aren't stopping to think about the implications of any of this. And that's, I mean, it's just not true. It's not an easy task to get put on you know, to, to get put on hormones as, as, as an adult, even in a lot of places, but especially for kids, that is a, it's a long process, but they make it out to be like, uh, one day your child comes, your boy comes home from school and he says, I like playing with dolls. And the next day you're like 
send them in for surgery. It's like, that doesn't happen, but that's how they're framing it to be. So they're telling these horror stories and saying, we have to do something to address this because children, they, they don't have, they don't know what's happening and they're being forced to do this and all of that sort of stuff, which would be kind of scary if, if that was true, but it's how, not, it's not. How, it's, yeah. how are we listening to the politicians and not the pediatricians? Right. How I, did they get... Well, see, one thing that they have that, that I think is uh, important to note, so there's, I can't remember, see, and this is the problem, I can't remember which one is the good one. There's one group that is a, like, I think it's the American Academy of P- Pediatrics. Yes, they're good. And then, the College of Pediatricians is bad. Yeah, there's the American, <laughs> there are two groups with very, very similar names. One of them- By design, I'm sure. One, yeah, exactly. One of them is the actual, like, legitimate large group of pediatricians in the country. The other one is a conservative group that has something like a hundred members and exists mostly to argue that gay people shouldn't be allowed to adopt, that HIV doesn't have anything to do with AIDS, you know, all of these or these weird right-wing conspiracy theories that they push that stuff. And they've been one of the ones saying, no, 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 trans kids don't need, don't need uh, to be affirmed. You should just reinforce their, reinforce gender roles and reinforce stereotypes. And, you know, your, your son who likes to play with dolls, he'll be a tough dude and, you know, all of that stuff, even though, there is no one on the planet who is saying if a boy plays with dolls, he's he's trans, or if a if a girl likes playing with trucks, she's she must be trans. That's how it That's starts. The, yeah, you pick up a truck, that. and the next thing you know, you're playing softball on ESPN. You know what happens next? But yeah. So so that's kind of the the, the trick here is they they start these arguments from such a place of bad faith that you spend all your time trying to get back to reality. To where you can't even advance your argument because you've you've been uh, dealing with theirs. One thing that this segment brought to my attention, and you know, the thing with a lot of these segments that we do on the Daily Show, we only have like four or five minutes for them most of the time, so a lot of stuff gets cut. But it is an opportunity to educate people who think they're allies about things that they did not know were happening. And in the research for this piece, the word "safe folders" kept coming up. Yeah. be honest with you, as a supposed it, thought I was an ally, ally, I didn't know what a safe folder was before we started researching this. And Chase, break that down in a way that our listeners could understand the threat and why these even exist. Yeah, I mean, so essentially what a safe folder is, is something that parents of trans young people um, specifically have developed over the last several years and decades, really. Um, And it's a folder that they carry around to show that their child is trans and that it's legitimate and that they're not doing anything wrong. So often it will have things like letters from family and friends saying, I know these individuals and I know this child and this child is living consistent with who they are. These are good parents. They'll have letters from doctors and pedi- you know pediatricians, maybe endocrinologists saying this care that this young person is being provided, whether that's just simple affirmation in the home or whether that's some form of hormone therapy is being provided under the supervision of a doctor. And the, the idea of the folder is that it's a way to protect the family against any sort of accusations from the state or from other private actors that they're acting in such a way um, that's not in their child's best interest. So it's a countermeasure to the widespread systemic transphobia in society in order to protect loving families um, to be able to continue to love and care for their children. And it's so counterfactual. I mean, it's like the idea that in this country of gender reveals, of little ladies' man onesies, that the pressure is to be trans is like, Absurd, right? There, there, there's like an, we're actually entertaining a discourse that people are pressured into being trans in a society that is so fixated on enforcing sex binaries. Like we can, we're starting wildfires with our gender reveals, and yet we're told that it's <laughs> it's the transness that people are being pressured into. When I mean, I spent most of my life trying not to be this way because of society. Uh, people are struggling deeply. The idea that people are just like popping out and everyone's like happy. Yes, being able to be who you are is incredibly liberating. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of struggle with family, with community, with doctors. And then people finally get to a point, a point of feeling good, of loving themselves. And the state's coming in is like, no, 
We're going to take that away. We're going to take away your health care. We're going to push you out of school. We're going to tell your parents that they can't affirm you in this way. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and it's a totally counterfactual, but quite terrifying narrative that we're letting uh, flourish. Um, and they're coming in and trying to make these like seemingly reasonable arguments that are like, oh, no, you know, we, the data is just not out yet. We need 50 years of randomized controlled trials before we know if this is really safe. I'm like, I'm sorry. Have you ever gone to a pediatrician with your kid? If you ask one question, they're like, you know what? I don't know. We don't know a lot. That's how pediatrics <laughs> works. They're like, it's a leap of faith. You're like, I don't know. My kid is has a stomach ache and we can give them this and we can give them this. But like, we don't have 50 years of data because that's not how pediatrics works. But we're, the state is coming in and saying, oh, but with this one thing, we need 50 years of data. And that's just a really disingenuous argument. People are buying it hook, line and sinker. And that's what's so frustrating. Yeah. Well, and also one thing that's happening right now is there are people who I think are very well-meaning and they will will see that and they'll hear those arguments and they'll go, well, why not just let them wait until they turn 18 and then they can do whatever they want? Just let them go through puberty. Maybe they'll be fine. But here's the thing. I mean, puberty is going through puberty is not a neutral. It's it, it's not a neutral option. It's when people talk about when they're worried about, oh, but what about permanent effects of possible hormones or this or that? I mean, going through your body's natural puberty, that has some permanent effects too. I wish more than anything that I hadn't gone through my body's natural puberty because it's it's created headaches. It's made me feel terrible. It's it's awful. And that's why I care about this. It's It's because I worry that we're we're at this point where people who don't know what they're talking about are trying to force kids to undergo their their body's natural puberty who may not benefit from that. You're allowing something to happen that you ultimately will medically have to reverse at yeah, some point anyway. Exactly. I mean, that's that's the thing. When people talk about trans women especially, you'll see, you know, the jokes always like, "Oh, here comes that this big burly, you know, uh looks like a dude and you know, all all the stuff, the, all the jokes in the 90s movies basically." Cool. Um, you know, those those sorts of things. That comes from the fact that you know, a lot of trans women have to go through their body's natural puberty. And some people after puberty, they're six foot five. And some people after puberty are, you know, I mean, I'm lucky in the sense that I'm five nine. Like, I'll take that. Five nine is okay. Um, but, you know, it's possible. I could have had, could have finished puberty with, with super broad shoulders and a super deep voice and all, all of this stuff that, that would have been pretty much impossible to do anything about. I mean, there's no, there's no surgery that makes your shoulders more narrow. There's no surgery that, that makes you, you know, a foot shorter. These things just don't exist. So really when, mm -hmm. when people are forced to, when children who know that they are trans and their parents know that they're trans, and this has been something that's been happening for years, forcing them to undergo puberty is cruel. The whole point of things like puberty blocking uh, medications is that it helps parents and, and trans teens buy time so that they, they can make the closest thing to a neutral decision on this at the latest possible stage. And that is what's, what's so frustrating about this is that asking for that bit of neutrality is is considered radical in a lot of a lot of places like nobody's telling all kids to go on puberty blocking drugs but if if you know your kid is trans and your kid knows that they're trans why would you force them to go through something that is going to be so physically and emotionally painful for them and have no benefits which is what a lot of us had to go through so with sports and i, I guess as a fan of sports, most sports, I'm still trying to figure out hockey. I swear I, I do not understand icing. I'm trying. I swear I'm trying. But I, I, I imagine that sports is the easiest vessel to make the analogies for non-trans people to latch on to, be it as an opponent or proponent of the issue, you know, because there's a common sense appeal 
to the idea of fairness, Parker. And you have a pretty nuanced view of how trans and cis people should compete against each other. But also, you think that most of the laws being passed around sports aren't really about fairness. If they aren't about fairness, then what are they about? Sure. I Well, these laws that target, they typically target kindergarten through 12th grade. They're just an excuse to send a message to kids saying you are not valid. Trans kids are not valid. They are not who they say they are. They are always other. And that is the frustrating starting point here. I mean, my view on on trans people in sports, I think is is pretty nuanced. And when someone says, do, do trans athletes have an advantage over cisgender athletes? I mean, the answer is Sometimes, maybe it depends, and it depends on what sport. It depends on when they start, how long someone's been on hormones. It depends on uh, any number of factors. I mean, one of the mo- most clear cut examples of a trans person having an advantage in sports was a trans boy who was forced to wrestle against girls because of Texas. It, once again, back to Texas, because of the way Texas's laws were set up. You had a trans boy who was on testosterone. Uh, his name was Mac Beggs. He was forced to make this choice of can he wrestle? He would have to wrestle against girls in high school because that was the way their law was set up. Or he could just not participate in sports at all. Those were the options given to him by the state of Texas at the time. And what he did was he ended up winning two uh, state championships, I believe. And in that case, it was an example of a policy that was meant to prevent trans girls from competing. And all Mac wanted to do was wrestle against boys because he was a boy. This policy was meant to ensure fairness, but what it did was it ensured that there was not fairness. And so when all of this was finished, you would think that the state would go, Oh, we got this totally wrong. We're gonna we're gonna fix that. We're gonna let him wrestle the boys, and we're gonna figure this out. No, that's not what they did because they didn't actually care about fairness. And I think that's why that that's one of those examples that I keep going back to because it just shows that how quickly they will shift from one one point to another. They'll talk about well, what if LeBron James decides he wants to play in the WNBA? I mean, that's a really out there kind of hypothetical, but I've heard it a ton. But when you're talking about kindergartners and when you're talking about children who school sports are mostly just about competing and making friends, that's where it's just cruel. You're, you're telling these kids, no, don't accept the trans student as one of you. That can't happen. And so really what it's about is it's about sending this message that trans kids aren't real, that they're, they can't be taken at face value, that they can't be trusted and all of that. And a lot of this is based on this assumption that people always know who is trans. If I was a trans student right now in school, I love sports, I I would not, you know, participate because I would be afraid. I'd be afraid that if I was if I was terrible that people would go you're taking a spot that someone else should have. I'd be afraid that if I was too good they would go you're you're taking a spot that someone else should have uh because you are cheating and you are really a, a man and all of this stuff that kind of comes up. It's very very frustrating to to watch this play out and to just see how completely devoid of compassion a lot of it is. To that point then, Chase, about lack of compassion, the ACLU has to fight multiple fights on multiple fronts at all times. But when we look at, let's just say, anti-trans legislation and anti-abortion legislation, what do you think that says about this government's care or concern about gender roles in this country and health care issues in this country. Yeah. So so going back to the LeBron James example, I was doing a panel with Laisha Clarendon, who plays in the WNBA, and Megan Rapino, who is a soccer player. And they were like, oh, yeah, like all of these men are really going to fake transition to play in women's sports where they get paid less, where they have to travel coach, where they don't get supported. Like, let's talk about the actual realities. And the same people who are pushing these bills in the name of 
supposedly protecting women's sports, they're never advocating for equal pay. They're not investing in girls' programs. The only way they seem to care about women's sports is by banning trans women and girls from sports. And that's not the primary priority of people who are invested in gender equity in sports, which is why Women's Sports Foundation, National Women's Law Center, opposes all these bills. They don't do anything for women's sports. They harm women's sports by empowering the state to continue to surveil and regulate the bodies of women and girls, which goes to the bigger question of, Look at the way in which anti-trans bills and anti-abortion bills are also being pushed in concert. Um, so you have lawmakers who are standing up saying they're pushing these anti-trans bills to protect women. Um, in the same hearing, they're trying to ban abortion. Um, and ultimately, what this is about is a government that is invested on you know reinforcing a uh, very specific Christian, heterosexual, white, uh, colonial notion of the family on the entire country, um, and in the process, restricting people's ability to have autonomy over their bodies. And that's why we're seeing uh, you know, more and more anti-abortion bills, more and more restrictions on access to contraception, more and more st restrictions on access to gender-affirming health care. Because at the end of the day, it's all part and parcel to the same set of systems that are designed to control us and to limit our ability to control our bodies. You're not supposed to, it's not legal to carry a flamethrower. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah. <laughs> it's not street legal. But you yeah. over there spitting facts. Yeah. After the break, I, I want to talk about the miseducation of us allies and who's culpable in that, as well as what can people do to be better allies to members of the trans community. It's Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Beyond the Scenes. Bringing it home, talking trans rights, Chase Parker. Now, Parker... I want to correct you on something from the previous break when we were talking about, you know, this idea of the things physically that the changes the human body goes through physically through puberty and the things that cannot be reversed. And you are 5'9", and you said you cannot get shorter. That is true. However, there is a new plastic surgery procedure going down to Miami where they will chop your shins, break it, and put a three-inch stent in both of your legs and attach and fuse your bone to that three-inch stent, and you can't walk for a year. But after you're walking again... You're a little taller. You'll be 5 foot 11. I, 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 for I the low saw price a of $70,000, not covered I by any health I saw a post cancer. about that, and it is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts my shins just thinking about just that. Just thinking about it. Just Ugh. thinking about it. So yeah. what what are the blind spots? Before we get into solutions and ways that people can okay. be better allies to the trans community, Parker, what are some of the blind spots that you think people have to what's actually happening in the larger sense of this conversation? Is it really just about not wanting my child to know about the LGBTQIA plus community too soon? Or is there something deeper and treacherous that we're just not getting? Sure. I th I think that what it comes down to in a lot of cases is that there are people who just wish that trans people weren't trans and that gay people weren't gay and you know that everyone was straight and christian and if they had it their way white you know that that is just kind of their their ideal world which is so flawed in so many ways however one thing that i think sort of gets gets missed in a lot of these conversations is just how exhausting it is existing as a trans person in public. You know, there, there are states that make it, that have recently tried to make it more difficult for trans people to update their ID documents, whether it's their driver's license or birth certificates. Imagine if you're going out to a bar and you walk up to the front door and you have to give the bouncer your, your ID so they can check it. And he looks and they sees, you know, a, a photo that that looks like you, but then has the wrong gender on it. Right there, you are outing yourself as trans to this bouncer and anyone he he comments about this to. You know, anyone he, if he asks a question out loud, it suddenly becomes everyone's business. You know, these sorts, sorts of things that are just such subtle invasions of privacy that, that factor yes. into our everyday lives. I mean, there, there are cases where people have, have lost jobs be, after being hired at places because, oh, we ran, your, we ran your ID documents through a background check and 
we realize that they don't match, you know, these sorts of things. And most states, I mean, I'm lucky enough. I was born in Illinois. I'm raised in Illinois. I live in Chicago. I'm, I'm about as okay as humanly possible for someone who is trans in this country, as far as location is concerned. My driver's license says female. My birth certificate says female. My passport says female. So I don't have to, to worry about that sort of situation but others aren't so lucky. And I think that that is something that, you know, these are just the small sorts of things that we do in our everyday lives, the small sorts of, you know, indignities, essentially, uh, that I just wish people could, could understand. And I think that there's this idea that trans people owe it to literally everyone around them to constantly be announcing to them, like, BT dubs, I'm trans. That is not how I want to live my life. If someone knows I'm trans, that's fine. If someone thinks I'm trans, that's also fine. But I don't go around announcing it to people. And I I would rather not have to tell people constantly if that's the case. But that is the sort of world that even if, even if people are still allowed to access medical care, even if people are allowed to, you know, exist and live and all of that stuff, if they are chipping away at our ability to be seen as who we are, as recognized as, you know, as men and women and non-binary people, when they're doing that, that is just, it's, it's getting involved in our lives in a very personal, invasive way that is just not their business. It's just, it's really, really frustrating. And I think that allies could do, do a lot just to just to listen to our experiences and to not get their news from from Fox and to think about things beyond sports and to think about things okay. beyond you know, drag queen story hour, whatever they're talking about on Fox and, you know, all of that. To that point, to that point then, Chase, two questions for you, Chase. One, to the point about allies doing more, you know, for kids that are struggling with their identities, what can family, friends and people within that community, what can they do to be a better ally? And what role does the media play in contributing to misinformation with regards to the perceptions of children that are going through um, this process and uh, or becoming members of that community? Yeah, I mean, I think when we're talking about young people and how do we support them, I mean, first and foremost, it's just to be uh, open to be kind, to not be enforcing, uh, you know, assumptions about gender at every turn. Like maybe next time someone's pregnant and they're, you're, you're talking to them, don't ask them if they're having a boy or a girl. Maybe next time you hear someone, you know, has a kid, you say, how old are they? Before you ask, you know, are they a boy or a girl? We cannot conceptualize anything without this binary. And yet the reality is, is that we are so much bigger than that. Um, and maybe you should ask, you know, if you're going to a birthday party, it's like maybe the interests of the child are more salient than their genitals, perhaps. Um, and that we can actually do a lot of work to deconstruct all of the assumptions that we're putting on kids, which are actually deeply harmful for almost all the kids. Norms of masculinity and femininity are greatly harmful across the board for so many people. We can do more to give our children more to work with, to be more expansive in their thinking. And so that is goes for those of us who are parents, those of us who are caretakers, those of us who are in community. Um, push your school to do better. You know, push your school to be more open. Um, there, there's a lot that we can do, particularly in this moment of extreme backlash where we're having governments try to stop history from being taught, try to cut people off from their histories. His, you know, the truthful history of this country, um, the truthful history that includes indigenous genocide um, and the enslavement of, of people from Africa, that is our history. And cutting people off from it doesn't benefit anyone. It benefits those in power, and benefits those in power, of course. And same with cutting off discussions of LGBTQ communities because we have a long history. We need to know that history and that that's something we can do for our young people is give them that history. So I think there's that piece of it. Then the media is a huge problem. The reality is, is that the media is completely and utterly complicit um, in what's going on right now, in part because the media takes the bait from the right to engage in debates that actually just reinforce the underlying assumptions that are fueling the anti-trans discourse. Every time we have a conversation that says, what is a woman? Every time we have a conversation that starts with our trans girls taking over sports instead of, you know, how could we advance gender equity in sports really? 
why aren't we having that conversation? Or why don't we have a conversation and say, how can we support our kids in the midst of a pandemic um, and school shootings? Because um, the answer is This not is bigger be... than Fox News, right? When you're yeah, saying this media, is, you're yeah, talking I mean, everybody. I'm like New York Times, Washington Post. I will, every single outlet that has a huge platform is complicit in this and repeating the assumptions on the other side as if they are factual and not calling out the misinformation. Um, about what is fueling this anti-trans discourse. We have an obligation to be uh, more ac accountable to our, each other by naming things that are part of a weaponized misinformation campaign that is designed at its core to stop people from being trans. That should concern us greatly. And I think that the media can and should and must do more. So I'd like to end with a question to both of you. Um, Chase, I'll let you fire off first. And then Parker, take us home. Kind of a 1A, 1B question. You know, it's Pride Month, so we're going to end on hopeful and positivity, <laughs> you know? And then after this, I will be all mailing you all a pint of that wonderful Pride Month ice cream that Walmart pulled off the shelves. I have a secret stash. What can people do to help make things better for the trans community? And what brings you joy? Chase first. I'll start with the joy because I think it's what people can do as well, which is just see us in our fullness. Um, because I love my community. I love being trans. It, it brings me immense joy uh, to be around people uh, who are so willing to challenge the assumptions about, uh, or the limitations that were put on them. Um, and it is beautiful, it is liberating to say, I can be more than what I was told I could be. That is a expansion of limits and I love expanding limits um, and that gives me joy and so to allies I mean there's lots of things you can do of course there's ways to engage there's money you can give there's political ways to engage there's changing your conversations you're having but also just see us see us see us for the full people that we are see us living our beautiful best lives I'm I am the most disgusting things are said about me on the internet every day all, every day telling me I shouldn't have a kid, telling me I'm disgusting and hideous and all of these awful things. And it's like, I feel great. I have a full, beautiful life. Um, and I want people to see that in us. Um, and I think that goes a long way to shifting the narrative um, wherein we're only ever situated as monsters or victims, but we're neither of those things as a general matter. Um, and so I think it's important um, to be seen. Love it. Parker. See, that was a great answer. And now here I am like, oh, God. Um, <laughs> I agree what, with What Chase. can we do? Yeah, yeah. Give, give the allies some tips. Straight yeah. us out. All right. So one thing I think that, that people can do is push back on, on politicians who, who are pushing these anti-trans bills. It may not directly affect you, but the trans community is so small compared to the general population, to, compared to everyone else, that we cannot necessarily affect change on our own. It's important that other people have our backs. We cannot fight back against anti-trans legislation, anti-trans policies, if other people aren't willing to say, this is wrong. I am standing up for this too. I am on your side. And I think that that is, is one of the most crucial things you can do. When you, when you see or hear someone saying something transphobic or just just being hateful generally, I mean, say something, talk to them. If you've got a relationship with someone and you think you can get through to someone, talk to them. Great. Don't vote for politicians who, who push anti-trans, anti-LGBT policies. Hold them accountable. Even if you, if you vote for a politician and they're not advancing trans rights or they're not fighting back against these attacks on trans rights, hold them accountable. Call your senators and your congressmen and all of that stuff. These things matter. They're important because we need numbers. It's a numbers game. And that's one thing that we, we just don't have. As much as people like to talk about how out of, oh, there, more people are identifying as trans. I mean, yeah, but it's still a very, very tiny f fraction of, of the population. And, and it's, it's very easy for us to get crushed if we don't have uh, people willing to fight for us okay um, as, as far as joy is concerned yes what brings you joy like what yeah. makes you proud to be who you are yeah i mean I, th I think one thing that brings me joy is just just still e existing i'm still here and that that is something that i didn't think would be the case 
10 years ago, 20 years ago. The fact that I I am here, I am 36 years old. I am, I am as surprised as anyone. So I think that that's, that's it. I try to remember that, that being alive is success in itself. Even if I am, even if I struggle, even if I'm depressed, being alive means that I have stood in there and I've hung in there and I have fought back against the things that are the people who are trying to make people like me not exist. So I, I live to spite them and spite makes me happy. Let's go with that. (laughs) Love it. Well, make sure to call your senators and get the Equality Act passed. This has been a wonderful discussion. I can't thank you all so much for being a part of it. Thank you so much to our guests, Chase and Parker. Thank you all for going beyond the scenes with me. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Play my theme music. <laughs>